According to the IUCN, there are over 45,300 species threatened with extinction, and we are constantly trying to find ways to help them. There's a whole host of different reasons why these animals are struggling, such as climate change, pollution, invasive species, disease, and human-wildlife conflict. Many of these issues are extremely controversial and hard to tackle, but it seems as though there might be an easy solution. If an animal is struggling in a certain area, why can't we transport them to another area with less dangers so that they can survive? Accidental and illegal introductions have already proven that this can help a species, as there are a few species such as the Burmese python that are endangered in their native range, but they are thriving in non-native ecosystems such as the Everglades. Unsurprisingly, there are a few very important reasons why we don't relocate endangered animals, and the first reason is directly linked to the Burmese python. If an endangered species is relocated to a different ecosystem, it could have a negative effect on the native species and it could be very hard to control. Over the past few hundred years, we humans have proven that we know very little about how complicated ecosystems are, or we've simply shown how little we care about native species. Some of the worst invasive species were introduced into non-native habitats unintentionally, but it's shocking to see how many invasive species were directly introduced by governments. These animals were usually introduced to solve a problem such as pest insects or pest rodents, but then they soon took over and started negatively affecting the native species. In quite a few cases, these introductions have led to extinctions, so the local governments are directly responsible for the extinctions of some native species. To try and avoid the tragic mistakes of the past, non-native introductions are very rare nowadays, and there are strict rules on what pets you can keep in certain countries where they could become a problem. The Burmese python is a great example of this because even though it's endangered across its native range, there are an estimated 100,000 to 300,000 Burmese pythons in Florida. Its adventure into the Everglades has benefited the Burmese python greatly, but its effect on the native species has been catastrophic. They both prey on and are preyed on by the American alligator, and they've had a massive negative effect on mammal numbers. Comparisons of road surveys conducted in 1996 to 1997 and 2003 to 2011 indicated declines from 88% to 100% in the frequency of raccoon, opossum, bobcat, rabbit, and fox sightings. There are a few other examples of threatened invasive and non-native species such as the European rabbits and the red-masked parakeet, and even though this situation benefits them, it endangers other species. Even if it was safe to introduce certain endangered animals, you'd only be able to properly manage the larger species. If you were to relocate insects or birds to non-native ecosystems, then it would be almost impossible to manage them, and if they started causing damages then there would be almost nothing that you could do to effectively remove them. This is one of the main reasons why we don't relocate endangered animals, as it puts many of the native animals at risk. One of the stranger reasons why we don't move threatened animals is because it can affect their evolutionary trajectory. All wild animals on this planet have evolved over millions of years to perfectly suit their natural habitat, and when you transport an animal to a new ecosystem, then it will eventually change and adapt to its new habitat. In a way, this would be humans playing the role of God, but this isn't something that we've shied away from in the past, and it's probably something that will be more prevalent in the future. For example, the Indian rhino is currently listed as vulnerable, and in theory, it could be transported to North America. The ecosystems of North America and India are competitive, but they are very different to one another. The Indian rhino is prone to aggressive outbursts as it's found in the same ecosystem as many dangerous animals, such as leopards, tigers, sloth bears, elephants, and crocodiles. Even though North America has many dangerous animals of its own, a life in North America is more peaceful for the Indian rhino. This could lead to the Indian rhinos in North America becoming more mellow over time, and they could eventually evolve new adaptations and behaviours to suit their new habitat. Over the course of millions of years, the Indian rhinos in North America could become very different to the Indian rhinos of India, and they could one day become separate species. 
This reason is very far down on the list of importance, as it would take a very long time to see any changes, and the counter-argument is that relocation should only be a temporary solution. Believe it or not, this kind of strategy already exists, and one of the most famous cases involves a nature reserve in South Africa. In the Laohu Nature Reserve, you can find some very impressive big cats, but surprisingly, these cats aren't lions. This nature reserve is home to some South China tigers, and this tiger population is believed to be extinct in the wild. In the 1950s, there were around 4,000 of these tigers in the wild, but thanks to Mao Zedong's anti-pest campaigns, by 1987 there were only around 30 to 40 left. Eventually, it was decided that drastic action needed to be taken, and a captive breeding program was started in the Lao Hu Nature Reserve. These tigers range across 1.8 square kilometers, and they hunt many of the animals in the reserve. The plan is to eventually reintroduce these tigers back into China, but it's still unknown if the project will be a success. In an ideal world, the endangered species would be relocated for a short period of time until they have recovered, and eventually they would be released back into their natural habitat. This brings us swiftly on to our next reason, and that's that animal relocation is extremely expensive. If you were to try and relocate a small endangered species such as a small marsupial, then you would first have to get a team of experts to find and gather up a breeding population, and then they would have to be shipped to a different country around the world. The capture of these animals would cause them great distress, and so would the shipping process. This could lead to the animals contracting diseases, and this could make the situation even worse. This process would be extremely high risk and expensive, and it gets even worse if the animal is larger. Many times on this channel, I have covered the story of the invasive hippos in Colombia, and today these hippos are causing major problems. The hippos in question are the descendants of Pablo Escobar's hippos, and just like Pablo Escobar, they are extremely dangerous and reckless. They threaten the native species by competing with them for resources, and they also affect the water quality and cause toxic algal blooms. If this wasn't enough, they are also threatening the local people, as at least two people have been attacked by hippos in Colombia. One unlucky farm worker was left with a broken leg, collarbone, and ribs, as the hippo threw him into the air and opened its mouth. One of these hippos was even killed in a collision with a car when it strayed into the road in the middle of the night, and this just illustrates how big a problem they have become in Colombia. Because of the damage to the ecosystem and because of the risk to human life, action had to be taken, and so far this action has been extremely expensive. At first, they tried to cull the hippos, but this was met with backlash as they are listed as vulnerable, and even though they are dangerous, they are still very popular with some of the locals. After this, they tried to sterilize the hippos, and in 2017, a large male was caught, castrated, and released to the cost of 50,000 US dollars. In March 2023, the Colombian government announced that they were planning to relocate 70 hippos, and they were going to be sent to India and Mexico. It's estimated that this would cost around 3.5 million US dollars, and this wouldn't even fully sort out the problem as there are an estimated 170 to 200 hippos in Colombia. This gives us an idea as to how expensive and complex moving large animals can be, and how things can soon get out of control. If endangered animals were to be relocated responsibly, then they would not only have to be moved to a new location, but they would also need to be transported back after they had increased in number. The money that would be spent on this project could be used more effectively on different conservation projects, but it could still work with smaller animals. Once again, our next reason ties in very well with our last reason, and that's because they're both human-related. If you were to introduce a potentially dangerous animal into a non-native ecosystem, then the people living there might not be thrilled with the decision. Judging by how some rewilding projects are met by farmers, there would likely be protests and human-wildlife conflict if dangerous animals were introduced. This could lead to the deaths of the introduced animals, and even further conflict and possibly jail time for the local people. Some farmers are very opposed to the Eurasian lynx and wolf reintroductions, and this has caused conflicts in many communities. 
On the other hand, it could still be disastrous if the animal introduced was a loved, cute species, as the project could become an unwanted tourist attraction, and it could negatively affect the species. For example, the red panda is currently listed as endangered, and some may believe that relocating them to a safer place is a good idea. If they were relocated to a forested area near human habitation, then it's more than likely that people will try and find them and take pictures of them. This could cause the red pandas stress, and it could put them at risk and even force them to leave the area. The increased road traffic in the area from the unwanted nature tourism could also put the introduced animals at risk, and this could jeopardise the whole project. Unfortunately, humans will almost certainly play a negative role if endangered animals are relocated. And this brings us on to our fifth and final reason. One of the main reasons why we don't try and relocate endangered animals is because of the risk of failure. Even if we ignore all of the previous reasons in this video, there's still the chance that the relocated animals will suffer due to unforeseen factors. As I've covered in previous videos on this channel, reintroductions don't always work, and animals can die off due to human-related factors, or even due to new diseases that are non-existent across their native range. There are many complicated factors that can lead to an introduction or reintroduction failing, and this is why these projects need extensive planning. Some red wolf reintroductions have failed due to hybridization with coyotes, and reintroduced ostriches in Israel seem to just disappear. The thick-billed parrot was reintroduced into Arizona in the 1980s, but the effort was abandoned by 1993. The main reason behind this failure was predation, as the parrots were picked off by predators such as goshawks. The thick-billed parrot was last seen in 1938 before its reintroduction, and since then there has been an increase in human development, residency and agriculture. It's believed that this could have led to an increase in the predatory birds, and these birds were more than happy to pick off the parrots. The parrots were also kept in 2 meter cube cages before release, and this would have negatively affected their ability to survive in the wild. Introducing a species into a new ecosystem doesn't ensure their survival, and if the species is endangered then the risk is much higher. If things go wrong then you haven't only wasted millions of dollars, but you've also reduced the number of the endangered animals, and this is the exact opposite of what you intended to do. It's understandable why people want to explore every possible strategy to save endangered animals, and as the human race has proven to be very bad at learning from its mistakes, we may have to resort to more extreme forms of conservation and rewilding in the future. For now, it seems as though there are more effective ways of helping endangered animals, but as this is a very complicated issue, I'd like to hear what you think in the comments down below. If you think there are any other reasons, then please also let me know down in the comments below. But for now, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.